Hi, and welcome to the Creative Living Bookshelf. I'm Jamie Riddler from Jamie Riddler Studios, and I have some great books for you. The books that are on my bookshelf right now, I am so excited about. <laughs> In fact, some of them I have been reading really, really, really slowly because I really wanted to savor them and I, I kind of don't want to finish them. <laughs> so first, let me start off with a writing book. This is called Wild Mind by Natalie Goldberg, Living the Writer's Life. Now I've talked about Natalie Goldberg books before and she's been on the Creative Living with Jamie podcast. I really have learned so much from Natalie. One of the things I love about this book is it is really short chapters in which she tells a story or illustrates something about writing and then gives you an exercise to explore. I always love the way that Natalie so succinctly and evocatively brings us to moments of illustration and then maybe that ties to um, the wonderful book that she's also written about her painting which I talked about on another episode of Creative Living Bookshelf and I wanted to share with you a little something something about from the book um, this chapter is called The Quiet Place and she is quoting from Katagiri Roshi who is her teacher and his book Returning to Silence and then draws the relationship between that practice and writing practice. So, um, Katagiri Roshi said in his book, Returning to Silence, that it is not important whether a spiritual teacher has reached the peak or not. What's important is how he has digested the truth he has experienced and how much this truth is manifested in the teacher's life moment by moment. And then she says, this is true of writing too. How much have I digested everything that I know and am, so that when I write a sentence, it comes out silent. And what I mean by silent is that it communicates directly to your heart and mind. There aren't any squeaky words that don't fit. Words that are afraid. <laughs> so you can see how this is an incredibly inspiring book for writing, but also life, the writer's life. I'm thoroughly enjoying it and uh, I hope you will too. And speaking of the writer's life, I am in love with this book by May Sarton, Journal of a Solitude. Yeah, May Sarton is a writer and this is literally her journals of her life living alone. And the very first introduction I had to this book it was so funny because it was just a simple thing, a simple thing talking about the birds that she sees in her garden and the plants that were blooming and it brought tears to my eyes because I felt so brought to that moment and it was a familiar moment to me too and it reminded me that in our own backyards and in our own life, you know, um, the things that we take for granted are actually sacred and interesting. <laughs> and so I may take for granted that I sit in my backyard in this city and that squirrels go by and I hear these birds and I watch my peonies bloom and that is the unique landscape of my life. And so when I'm reading about the unique landscape of May's life, it reminds me of how special that is. And I think too, just like with Natalie Goldberg, there's this intersection of what it means to be a writer, a creator, and what it means to live your life. And so I'm just going to read to you the very first paragraph of um, May Sarton's book. Begin here. It's raining. I look out on the maple where a few leaves have turned yellow and listen to Punch the parrot talking to himself and to the rain ticking gently against the windows. I am here alone for the first time in weeks and take up my real life again at last. That's what's strange, that friends, even passionate love, are not my real life, unless there is time alone in which to explore and to discover what is happening and what has happened. I've been blogging for a long time, and this had some resonance for me, particularly with that 
form of expression, that there's a way that we live our lives, and then again, like Natalie said, we digest it, we process it, we turn it into our creation and offer it out into the world. And that has been a powerful thing for me in blogging, and I can see that this is, I mean, a blog is a journal, right? Um, and that's what I love about reading May Sarton's journals, too. And speaking of the garden, I am in love with this book, Second Nature, A Gardener's Education by Michael Pollan. And one of the things I love so much about this book is it is also an intersection. It is an intersection of memoir and intellectual thought. I love how Michael writes about his own life in gardens from when he was a little boy until now as a grown man experiencing what it's like to build a garden himself. But he really situates that conversation, that personal story in the history of gardens and what they mean to us as a culture, particularly in the United States. Uh, what yards mean. One of the conversations I particularly love is his defense of the garden, in particular in the context of our romantic view of the wild. He really takes a stand for the power and the beauty of the garden. And to just give you a little bit of a flavor of what the storytelling aspect is like. See, this touched my heart so deeply too um, because it took me back to the garden. My first garden was a place no grown-up ever knew about, even though it was in the backyard of a quarter-acre suburban plot. Behind our house in Farmingdale on Long Island stood a rough hedge of lilac and forsythia that had been planted to hide the neighbor's slatwood fence. My garden which I shared with my sister and our friends, consisted of a strip of unplanted ground between the hedge and the fence. I say that no grown-up knew about it because in an adult's picture of this landscape, the hedge runs flush against the fence. To a four-year-old, though, the space made by the vaulting branches of Forsythia is as grand as the inside of a cathedral, and there is room enough for a world between a lilac and a wall. Oh, that takes me back so much to my childhood, to the gardens we had in Montreal, to the gardens that my mom insisted on taking us to everywhere we traveled. And when I was young and we would go to these botanical gardens, I sort of thought, yeah, they're okay, you know, a little dull. And more recently when I've traveled and I've stopped at a place like that and I've watched the kids run around and play, I got it. <laughs> You know, I got it that it was being immersed and connected to nature, to beauty, and freedom. And that's what it reminds me of. So this book has been an absolute delight for me. It's left me thinking a lot. And um, this is one of the ones I'm reading really slowly because I don't want to finish. I also want to introduce you to Flow Formula. A Guidebook to Wholeness and Harmony, which is written by Sunny Schlanger, who is a friend of mine and has also been a guest on the Creative Living with Jamie podcast. And this book is Sunny's Labor of Love. This is a lifetime commitment to the pursuit of flow. Sunny's originally a professional organizer and she is an author. And in this book, I love the way she pulls together the threads of her life and shares with us her philosophy about getting in touch with things like synchronicity and manifestation and clearing in order to create more flow in your life. I think maybe I can see the theme in all of these books about the place where our life philosophy uh, comes out of an organic relationship to the life we've lived and the what we believe. And Sunny truly shares this. And one of the things I love about this book is you can really hear her voice. She shares wonderful personal stories that have make me laugh <laughs> and that make me think and so um, and really inspire me to think more about paying attention to and allowing flow into my life. Another book that's really uh, made me think Actually, it's really contributed a lot to my creative life 
is Shooting with Soul by Alexandra Cava. Now, I, I love Alex, and um, this book you can clearly see just from the cover. It's just filled with gorgeousness. Like, it's a beautiful, beautiful book that really shows um, Alexandra's gift for photography. And this book is designed so that there are lessons, prompts that you can follow so you could explore uh, milestones and new beginnings, traditions, capturing the seasons, mornings. And it's one of the reasons why this book is taking me some time to go through too because I want to really be present with each of the exercises that Alex shares. But one of the things I got from this book, I think it took me about 15 minutes of reading to become a better photographer, thanks to Alex. And um, that's because there is a beautiful balance in this book between giving you some technical information, some ways to understand aperture and f-stops and, and things like that, which I find totally overwhelming. And I found um, Alex's explanations of things like ISO and shutter speed really helpful and clear. In conjunction with that are these wonderful, opening, creative ways of seeing. And the piece of advice that really made that difference for me, and I can honestly see it in all of the photos that I took in my recent trip to Holland, was to slow down and think. There's a way that Alex is encouraging us to connect to the moment and then to feel into what is it about this moment that I want to capture in this photograph. It feels like magic to me. It's like how if this moment is about love or if this moment is about wonder or if this moment is about tenderness, how can I hold that in this photo? So she's opened up a whole new world to me with photography in this book, and I'm really, really thankful for that. And speaking of opening up to a whole new world, I, Flora Boley's book, Brave Intuitive Painting, Let Go, Be Bold, and Unfold, an incredibly beautiful book. You know, if you are a fan of Flora's painting, and honestly, how could you not be, then it's just a delicious delight to open up this book and peruse through it. This book also, I can totally see a theme of what I'm being in love with right now, really combines Flora's philosophy of being bold and being in the moment and experimenting and seeing what happens. Uh, that reminds me of Sunny's too, right? Being open to the intuition, to the connection, and allowing it to flow in your life. And also, she gives us some technique places to take off from. One of my favorite, favorite things in the book, because I'm a relatively new um, painter, and I still feel sensitive. I still have my tenderness around the visual arts, but I love, I love it very, very much. And so one of the things I love is she goes through a section of suggested tools, and some of them are a bit untraditional, and I love that too. But not only does she suggest a tool like uh, rags, and then she'll explain how rags could be used in painting, but then she gives you prompts too. So wrap the rag around your pointed finger and drag this finger through the wet paint to reveal the color beneath. Add wet paint to your canvas with a rag. Bunch up your rag and drag it through large areas of wet paint. Like, so it, she doesn't just leave you like, yeah, you can use a rag. It's like, and, and. And of course, when I read things like that, I want to try it. <laughs> And this is one of the things I really um, want to encourage people to do when you watch something like Creative Living Bookshop. If you pick up this book, and I hope you do with all of these books, don't just read it. Do it. Live it. Try it. Experiment it. Let these books be a springboard to your creative life. Paint and experiment with flow and garden and keep a journal and grab your camera and let it be the beginning of a grand adventure in your creative life. I am so glad that we are on this creative living adventure together. And if you haven't already, please come by Jamie Riddler Studios at openthedoor.ca and join up. That way we can stay connected and continue this beautiful, beautiful journey. I am Jamie from Jamie Riddler Studios and I hope you enjoyed my creative living bookshelf.